are going to Luke chapter 7 and verse 24, and it says, When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees, they keep popping up here in the stories in Luke, and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. To what then should I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine and you say he's, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all of our children. Let's pray. Father, your word is true and it speaks to us. And we need to hear what it's saying today because this is important and it speaks to our generation. And so, Father, we open our ears and our hearts. We're ready to receive, speak. And we thank you for it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, I'm going to give you a pre-warning before I get into this. Everybody ready for your pre-warning? Stick with me. Because I'm getting ready to start with something that there's going to be a person or two, if I don't give this pre-warning, they're going to go, if that's what he's preaching about, I'm not listening to that. So stick with me. Back in 1987, there was a rock group called U2. Stick with me. And they put out this album called Joshua Tree, which was one of their, their best albums. And they had several songs that became hits off of Joshua Tree, but the biggest one and the one that became kind of their song that they were known for had these lyrics, and, and just got the first verse here. I've climbed the highest mountains, I've run through the fields, only to be with you, only to be with you. I've run, I've crawled, I've scaled these city walls, these city walls, only to be with you. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Now, if you were doing the 80s with me, which a lot of us were, you will remember this song became really popular, and this became an anthem for a lot of people, and they would sing it, and it spoke of their lives, and it sounded very deep and very spiritual, and there was, was a lot of people talking about this song, and you heard it everywhere that you went, and I always like kind of critical reviews of things, and, and I found this review that it's, it's very, when it comes to reviews, it's very reviewy. If you understand what I'm saying, you will in a minute. It's from Cashbox Magazine. That was something they used to sell on what they called newsstands back in the 80s, for those of you that are newer. But this is Cashbox Magazine says, typically drenched in Bono-esque pathos. And Bono was the lead singer. And Edge, who was their guitar player, Edge Guitar Atmospherics still has the power of spiritual conviction delivered from the perspective of the desert sojourn rather, rather than the comfort of the promised land. Is that reviewy enough for you? Now, you're wondering why you're having to hear about a rock song and why you're having to hear a cash box review of that song from back in the 80s. It's because this review catches what, what we're looking at today. And that song catches what we're looking at today we are in a world of searchers. There are people who are looking. We have been among those searchers. Every person who lives and breathes is searching for something, but they don't know what. 
And so we get these songs, we get these things, and, and, and we put it in this context of it's a spiritual look, this, this spiritual journey, this thing, but, but people are looking and they can't find it. They still haven't found what they're looking for. And I think of this this morning as, as I read these words of Jesus, because this is what Jesus is talking about, people looking and people searching and not able to find it. But he's given us some hope and he's saying there is something out there that you are looking for. And yes, it is there and you can find it because I'm giving that to you. And it's coming at the end of this, this story that we've been in about John the Baptist. We started it last week and if you remember, John the Baptist was was this great prophet, and, and he, he kind of opened the way for Jesus. But he's a real strong preacher. And, and Herod, the Tetrarch, who kind of rules this area, hears some things that, that John is saying, and, and he gets mad at him, and he puts him in jail. And John is, is all, you know, he's, he's at this place by himself, and he's starting to wonder if I missed it. What am I doing in jail? I don't, I don't belong here. The Messiah was coming to end jails and these kind of things. Is this really the Messiah? And so he sends this question to Jesus through some of his disciples. Are you the one who's to come or should we look for somebody else? And so they come, they ask Jesus and Jesus is kind and tells them to consider the evidence of my ministry and the things that I'm saying and, and, and blessed he is not offended because of me. And so he gets this and, and the disciple, his disciples leave John the Baptist's and everybody who's been listening to Jesus, they've heard this exchange. And they're really confused. Because they're wondering, is John the Baptist backing out of his ministry, of his responsibility? And what we get with what Jesus is saying is this is a defense that he's making of John. But he's also speaking to us in our day. And he's telling us that, you know, there's things that we're searching for. And he starts asking these questions. He, they leave and he says, what did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Now, I think we know what a reed is, right? We pretty well got that down. And we kind of get this clue of, of a reed, this little thin kind of pipey thing, if we think of cattails on a reed or, or the kind of grass that grows out along swampy places. And, and we know that when the wind blows, those things get whipped all over the place. And Jesus is comparing the reed that grows to a certain kind of person. And it's the kind of person that's spoken of in James 1, a double-minded man who's unstable in all of his ways. And Jesus says, were you looking... For a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. In other words, were you looking for somebody who was going to tell you what you wanted to hear to make you feel good about yourself? Whatever you were doing, that's exactly what they said was, was good for you. I'm reminded of all the false prophets who were uh, found in the Old Testament, and, and some of them uh, just tragic, some of the stuff they were saying and misguiding people. Sometimes it could almost be comedic. I think of, of, of Micah talks about of some false prophets he was dealing with, and he just got so sick of them. He said, if some guy comes along saying he's a prophet, saying free beer, that's just the kind of prophet these guys need. There's phony prophets out there, he's saying. They're, they're lying to you. And Jesus is saying, in your search, were you looking for someone to justify your behavior and saying you don't need to change because everything's good with you. See, we're told this will be a characteristic of these last days. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And so if you're listening to somebody who's telling you a bunch of stuff that you've heard, you know what the gospel is, and they're saying, well, that's not what it really means. You can do whatever you want to do. Know that those are reeds that are being pushed all over the place. And, and here's the problem with those that are searching. What reeds will say will sound good and will smooth our conscience, but what they are saying will never last. They are not what we are looking for. 
But Jesus says there's another kind of guy they may have been looking for. What, what did you go to see, he asked. A man dressed in, in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What's he mean by this? Soft clothing. He's talking about fancy clothes. He's talking about cool clothes. And he's saying, what did you go out to see? Were you looking for a cool guy? Somebody that, that you could try to be like? He's dressed real sharp, and, and, and he's the kind of person everybody's wanting to hear. And, and, and so that's, that's exactly what you were looking for, is the cool guy? Well, John the Baptist was not a cool guy. Matter of fact, he wore camel skins for his clothes. And that wasn't uncommon in that day because there was a whole group of people who wore camel skins and they weren't the cool people. They were the very poorest people who lived kind of in the gutter. And so this would automatically say, this is a person in poverty. You don't want to be like this guy. That's what John wore. And, and, and they didn't go to places cool people hung out and was the place everybody knew, if you're cool, this is where you'll be found. He's hanging out in the wilderness. He's, he's out in the desert. And so Jesus is saying, this is, it's, it's not a cool person that you were looking for. And you know, there is nothing wrong with being cool or you guys wouldn't be here listening to me right now. Okay, that's a joke. Hang with me, please. That's a joke. Stick with me. But, but you know, there's nothing wrong with hearing what cool people say. And, and the, they, there's a lot of them. They're very knowledgeable. They're good people. We respect them. But the problem is, sometimes when we get around people who have that kind of vibe that we want to be like, we turn our brains off. And we're not really measuring what they say. We're not really making sure that there's substance that's in line with, with the kind of character that you're supposed to have. And this brings me to, of course, everybody knows where we're going now, President Warren Harding. Weren't you all thinking about him just this morning? And so I'm just bringing it back around. Maybe you haven't ever thought, maybe you didn't even know there was a President Warren Harding. Well, about 100 years ago, almost exactly, there was a President Warren Harding. And uh, he was a guy that was a newspaper editor in Marion, Ohio. And he really hadn't done much with his life, but, but he meets this guy who is kind of a mover and shaker and manipulator of politics, Harry Daughtery, in 1899. And, and Harry Daughtery takes one look at Warren Harding, and he says, and he hears him talk, and he says, this man sounds presidential. This man looks presidential. People will vote for him. And so what ends up happening is this, this manipulator of political systems works the future for Warren Harding. He gets him to the right places. He ends up getting him elected to the Senate to represent the state of Ohio. He realized at the presidential nominating convention in 1916, if I can just get him up to give a speech and people see him, we're going to look good in 1920. And sure enough, he got him to speak. And in 1920, Warren Harding becomes the nomination for the Republican Party. Now, here it is. He hasn't done much of anything, and he really wasn't that smart. And his skill set was kind of presidential, kind of political, but it really wasn't going to help him a lot because he was a really good golfer. He was an incredible poker player. He was very good at drinking and holding his alcohol. And he also is one of the most known womanizers who ever ended up in the presidency. And we've known a few other stories. So that's saying something, right? But hey, he looked good. And he sounded good when he talked. Now, the people who remember his speeches and the records we have, they say that they were nothing more than a bunch of kind of pompous catchphrases that he would just rattle off. But they sounded good because his voice sounded good. And so here he is, he's in office several years, dies of a heart attack, and the nation, he's very popular, and the nation goes into mourning, they raise all this money to set up this huge marble mausoleum memorial, it's one of the nicest memorials for any president, they built it in Mary, and Lois and I have been there, and uh, it's just a beautiful thing, and everybody's wanting to go for the dedication, but then they find out, they find out that he has one of the most corrupt administrations in the history of the United States. Still to this day, 100 years later, he still stands out as one of our most corrupt presidents. 
or most corrupt administrations, and, and they begin to discover that he was a terrible president. And suddenly, they can't get anybody to go to Marion, Ohio to dedicate that because they didn't want any tie with them. And they realize how bad he was. And to this day, when you see these lists of bad presidents, Warren Harding manages to rise up to the top. We salute you, Warren Harding. Thanks for making some of the other guys that we've been dealing with in our lifetime look a lot better, right? So here we are. And we learn from Warren Harding, we learn that maybe it might be wise to keep looking if what we're using as our standard, somebody cool that we want to be like, they may not really be what we're looking for. And so Jesus says, what? What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Mm, yeah, that's what you were going for. Because he was, he was more than a prophet. This is he of whom it's written, behold, I'll send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. John the Baptist said it the way it was. If you were going out there to hear John the Baptist, you're going to get your toes stepped on. You're going to realize that there was something that when God says he's coming to save, there was things in your life you needed to be saved from and you were not good enough as you were. This is the message of John the Baptist and he was saying that one greater than me is coming. And Jesus goes on and says about him, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And this isn't saying that John failed or, or that he messed up or, or that somehow we're superior to him in every way. It's just saying that John never got to taste what he had talked about. He died before Christ was resurrected. He died before the, the door to the kingdom of God was fully opened. He passed away. He never got to taste of those things. But we've got those things. We've had those. What Jesus came to do in being a Savior, if we're saved right now, if we're Christians, we're, we have experienced things that John could only dream of. And so Jesus is telling us, if we want to find what we are looking for, then we need to recognize what John the Baptist was talking about. And we have to realize that it's more than just hearing about it. It's going to require a decision on our part. And this is what he says. Luke gives us this little aside kind of explaining this. In verses 29 and 30, he says, When all the people heard this, and, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. And so the people who are kind of outcasts that are there listening to Jesus, they're like, yep. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. John the Baptist, that's a man of God. Man, he, he scared me straight. He got me to turn around. He put me on God's path. I know I made a decision. When I, heard, when I heard the message of John, I knew it was time to turn some things around in my life. But here they are again, the Pharisees. And these are lawyers kind of with the Old Testament law. So we're not going to throw anything at lawyers today, are we? Oh, we got to, no. No, we, we won't do it. So the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves. I'm not going to have any of that because they wouldn't even let themselves be baptized by John. And this is a reminder, and it brings up something that we've got to see. There is a battle that is going on. And there are people who are looking but they are looking because they really don't want to find. They're looking because they are choosing to remain in their confusion. And they end up at this place that ultimately they harden themselves to the answer that is there. And that is the answer of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says, I, I don't even know how I can, can compare the people of this generation. I'll just, I'll just say this. They're, they're like little kids in the marketplace and, and they're mad because you won't dance to their tune and you won't be upset about what, when they're upset about something. They, they expect you to do what they're doing. And they get mad when you won't be. They're, they're mad that you won't live life their way. They're mad that you won't take on their causes and their issues. And here's the problem in our world today where we are saturated with media. We're saturated with TV and movies that tells us that there are certain things we're supposed to accept if we're going to be good people. 
if we're going to be cool people, if we're going to get this together, and we want to, we want to be accepted and liked, then, then we're going to have to accept X, Y, and Z. And maybe P, D, and Q along with it. Actually, it's a restaurant now, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Owned by our beloved Tim Tebow. So P, D, Q is good. Take that off the list. Let's go M, N, L, O, P. We've got to accept with it. And so we, we are at this place that there is this, this preaching that we do as we're speaking the truth of God and people say, oh, the church is so preachy. Let me promise you something. The world's preaching too. And they've got a message. And they're telling you that there are certain issues and there's things that they are shoving down our throat and media is, is, is repeating those things to us. And we pick up our phones and, and, and we see these causes over and over and we're seeing certain kinds of thinking that, that the Bible pushes and, and speaks of that's the word of God and they're telling us that if you believe that, you're stupid or you're narrow-minded, or you're whatever. It goes on through these things, and we have to realize there is a battle that is taking place right now. And they're telling us, it's okay to keep searching as long as you're looking for a read that tells you whatever you believe, you're okay. And it's okay to keep searching as long as you're, you're, you're looking for a cool person that you want to be like. As a matter of fact, we've got a bunch of actors and actresses that will tell you how you should be living your life. That's okay. It's okay as long as you come to our Wizard of Oz and you expect, expect, ex accept his smoke and mirrors and you allow his phony baloney to become what you ex accept and you live your life by. But Jesus says, if you're coming after me, get ready. There's things that it's going to cost you. There's things you're going to have to lay down. There is a way you're going to have to walk that is in an opposite direction of the world. There are days that you will have to surrender things because when you come to me, I am calling you to a holy life. I'm calling you to begin to live different than the people who are around you. I am not calling you to be a little better than the world. And you can look and say, well, I'm okay. Look how bad they are. And I'm not that bad, so I'm all right. That's not good enough. Jesus tells us that if we are looking for something that's going to satisfy, he says if we're going to come after him, this is Luke 9, 23 through 25, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's a denial on this path. But it's what we're really looking for. For whoever would save his life will lose it. You want to save your life? You want to find what's real? It's going to require laying down the way we think it should be and saying, God, I want it the way you say it's going to be. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, will save it. The promise that God gives, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world by dancing to their tune? And crying with them on the things they say to cry about and know so all the songs about searching but not finding. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Jesus calls us to give all and he wraps all this up by saying this line. And this is this is powerful line. Yet wisdom is justified by all of her children. Somebody says, are you looking you still haven't found what you're looking for? You want to know what the answer is? Look at the people you want to be like. Look at those who are confident that they know who God is. Look at those whose lives have been turned around. Look at those who've been in the gutter and, and everybody gave up on them, but one day they discovered Jesus and he lifts them out of that place. Look at those who, who have people who know God and know how to stand with him. Look at people who understand the power and the potential of prayer. Look at people who understand and live by the, the direction of God's word and realize that you can find what you're searching for. And the answer to what we are searching for is found only in Jesus Christ. And he calls us today. Will you bow your heads with me across this building? And as we're doing this, I just want us to kind of just search our hearts and say, what have I been looking for? Have I been looking for that which is just what's going to make me happy? What's going to 
make me feel like I'm doing okay, things that are not really going to last? Am I looking for things that I think somehow are going to make me cooler or look like I'm, I've really got it together? If you are, you're going to find emptiness and disappointment. But Jesus calls us today to him. And so I just want to, before we go any further, I just want to ask right now, is there any of us that will say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. I need to get things right with him. Is there anybody that just lift your hand and say, I'm not a Christian, but today I want to be a Christian. Maybe, maybe you're lifting your hand saying, I was, amen, I'm seeing hands. Maybe you could say, I was a Christian, but I've, I've walked away from God. I'm needing to come back. But maybe you've never been a Christian. You've never, you've, you've been around church. You've been around church people, but you've never actually given your life to God. You've never answered the call that he is giving to you today. And he's calling you to follow him, to become one of his own. Is there anybody else this morning, those of you on live stream, can lift your hand where you are there. This isn't about me seeing it. This is about just saying to God, God, I'm here. I'm surrendering life as I've been living it because you're what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm ready. Amen. We're going to say this prayer. And I'd like to just get our, our board members and pastors to kind of come and stand across this front. Why don't we just stand together as we say this prayer? And once we've prayed it, I'm going to just open this front up. And if you're needing prayer for anything this morning, maybe it's about your search, maybe it's about some things you're struggling with, but I, we're going to have our board members and pastors up here to pray for you. And we're going to just believe this morning that God's going to, there's some answers God's wanting to give you today. Let's pray that prayer. Heavenly Father, I've made mistakes. I've done things wrong. I want to turn that around. I want to live for you. Forgive me for all the wrong that I've done. You're what I'm searching for. And you're who I will follow. Thank you for this new beginning. I love you, Jesus. And I thank you for your love for me. In your name.